Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. I'm Elizabeth Gettleman Galicia, Vice President of Advocacy of Common Sense at Common Sense. I want to welcome you all to this week's conversation with Commerce Common Sense. We, it's a weekly series where we talk about the issues that we as parents, educators, and citizens are facing during these challenging times. Today, we're here to talk about elections in the digital age, how to cut through the noise. Let me introduce you to our guests. Kyra Kyles is the CEO of YR Media, formerly known as Youth Radio, an award-winning national nonprofit serving youth storytellers in media, music, and technology. Hani Farid is a professor at UC Berkeley whose research focuses on developing techniques to analyze and authenticate digital content. And he's also on the newly formed Safety Advisory Council at TikTok. Christian Arana is the policy director at Latino Community Foundation, where he leads the foundation's efforts to advance policy solutions that will improve the lives and political power of California's Latinos. Before we jump in just a bit about today's program, we'll talk for about 30 minutes or so and then take questions via the chat. Look for the prompt around the 30 minute mark to start adding your questions and we'll do our best to get to as many as we can. Now let's get started uh, with a deep breath, everyone. Um, no matter your political leanings, this election season has taken its toll on ourselves, on our communities, on our relationships, on civic discourse, and on our trust in institutions, including online ones. Uh, so let's start out as experts, you all of you who are deep in this work, I wanna ask each of you, how are you coping with the flood of election news? And what is a piece of advice you have for the overwhelmed voter? Kyra, maybe we'll start with you. Okay, no problem. <clears throat> well, I'll say, you know, I think that this election has been overwhelming for very many people. And we're almost in a, a situation where we're getting drowned by election information. So I would say one thing I know is that, you know, the information is out there, but make sure that you're checking it, verifying it, doing your research. And I would also say it's very healthy to sometimes take a break. As someone who works in journalism and works with youth journalists, it's okay sometimes to say, hey, you know what, I'm going to rewatch Friends, I'm going to watch Lost. You know, don't feel that you have to stay attuned to every single update because sometimes that can just cause a fatigue and then it can also lower your defenses and send you down a rabbit hole of misinformation. So I would say it's great to be informed, but it's also great to, to give yourself that break that's very much needed as we creep toward November. Great. Yeah, I don't know what I'd do without Great British, British Baking Show. Uh, Christian? My uh, sure. Well, thank you so much, uh, Elizabeth, and uh, thank you to Common Sense for, for hosting me and, and the rest of the panelists today. Uh, so yeah, so I will, I will admit uh, it's been a bit of a struggle um, these last couple of days, really, and last couple of months. Uh, it seems like every, every single time I check my Twitter account, uh, there's breaking news, right? Uh, so I think what I've done, uh, similar to what uh, Kyra was mentioning, um, I've just learned how to turn it off. Um, and one of the most concrete things that I've started to do is actually take off the notifications. Um, because I set up notifications for like New York Times, CNN, like, you know, as much as I want to be an informed voter, um, you know, there are times where not everything is a breaking piece of news, right? So, um, you know, we just got to learn to turn it off. And uh, I guess my Netflix show is The Crown. <laughs> I haven't had a chance to watch it. Uh, so I'm finishing up the season before the new season comes out. So uh, that's how I'm trying to cope. Great. And honey? Well, a couple of things. So first of all, take all the social media apps off of your phone, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, YouTube, just, just delete it from your phone. Um, get it out of that the hands. I'd go further and say, just get off of Twitter and Facebook and stay away from YouTube. Um, social media has, has created these echo chambers and these rabbit holes and these filter bubbles that I think are incredibly unhealthy. And I think you should particularly be minimizing um, social media, particularly at this time. Um, there is obviously tension. We want to be informed citizens, but we don't want to be doom scrolling for hours a day. So I set um, strong rules for myself. I read the the, the news uh, once in the morning and once at the end of the day and not in between. Um, I think you have to self-regulate. Uh, and I think so getting off of social media and then as both Kyra and Christian has said, you know, really sort of controlling the doom scrolling. It's very easy to do and, and, and spin out of control. Great. Um, so question for you, Kyra, you work with young people um, and they're engaged, 
young people who are, are not may not yet be voters or this is the first time they're voting in a, a climate where um, you know it's really hard to navigate information online um, and election information in general. Can you talk about how the young people you're working with are navigating this the, the twists and turns of this election season? Yes, well, the young people we're working with are also journalists. So they are kind of attuned through work that Wire Media has done and the work they do on their own to kind of separate the real from the fake. That's in fact part of our curriculum is, is figuring out what is fake news and how not to spread misinformation in your attempt to be first. You know, you also have to try to be right at all times. I think, you know, they're they're overwhelmed by it, but I think they're also very excited. You know, we have a lot of young people that are going to be working at the polls. Um, they've been marching, they've been protesting, they're very attuned to what's going on in this country. And they're also very attuned to the fact that they can make a serious impact. And I think because there are so many things at stake, the pandemic, Black Lives Matter, systemic injustice, housing instability, job loss, you know, not being able to go to college or some having to drop out of school. I think that they have a different sensibility about it and there's an urgency to it. So though I feel that it is overwhelming for all of us because there's so much at stake, what I'm um, excited about is that young people are talking about voting, they're driving this conversation and they're coming to us saying, hey, you know, how can we inform others? So we have a lot of toolkits that we've been producing, like how, why you should not maybe take a, a selfie ballot, even though it might be exciting for you. You know, how do you register to vote right now? Like, what's the right way to do it? How do you do mail-in voting? So they really trying to make sure that not only are they informed, but that other young people that this might be their first time are informed as well. And maybe remind people, why don't you want to take a selfie at the ballot with your ballot? Well, you know, so you can be disqualified. You can get in trouble with the law. So, you know, it, it may seem like, oh, you know, this is something that we're just used to doing. Take a selfie when you're in the restaurant. Take a selfie when you go, you know, out traveling. But, you know, going inside of the booth, you know, we had to create a guide because it's not in all states, but in certain states there is, you know, peril if you if you are to do that. So we just want to make sure that people are fully aware because, as we can see, there are some that don't want everyone to vote. And so they'll take any excuse they can to disenfranchise you. So don't give them any ammunition. Yeah. And with so much at stake this year, I mean, the, there's the elections, the once in a decade census, uh, and the pandemic has really forced outreach and engagement entirely online. Christian, what are what are some of the benefits and challenges in using social media to organize and particularly the Latinx community? Yeah, no, thank you for the question. Um, you know, first, I, I mean, let, let me, I guess, let me just break it down for a lot of people here. So, you know, when we talk about the Latino vote uh, and when we also talk about Latinos in the census, um, just to give you a couple of uh, data points, you know, there are 32 million eligible Latino voters uh, in this country. Uh, California has roughly about 8 million of them. So essentially one in four Latino voters lives in the state of California. Uh, this, actually, this election actually marks the first time that Latinos will make up the largest ethnic voting block in the country. Uh, so when you start to break, about, break down these numbers, uh, roughly half of Latino voters are under the age of 35 years old. So in reality, when we talk about the Latino vote, essentially what we're talking about is the youth vote. Um, and then mm -hmm. when we talk about census, you know, there are about 60 million Latinos that live uh, in the United States, the median age is roughly about 27 years old. So, so forgive me for repeating, you know, Latinos are a young population, right? I say all that because knowing that these platforms, right, whether it's Facebook or YouTube or whatever it is, it, it, it actually is an incredible asset for the Latino community because we as Latinos are actually using it. Uh, you know, this is the place where we're organizing. This is the place where we're getting informed. Um, th this is also the place where we're having conversations uh, about, you know, how to be better allies to the black community or talking about climate change uh, or whatever issue it is. So, um, you know, there was a report recently by Nielsen that, uh, that found that even within coronavirus, like 57% of Latinos are more likely to use social media to get information for COVID, right? So, you know, when we talk about the challenges of all that, um, you know, like we, what like what we've been discussing so far, like misinformation is rampant, right? We know that Latinos rely on these platforms for information. So essentially, how do we, you know, kind of regulate uh, misinformation, identify it, take it down, kind of thing? Um, and you know, I don't want to sound like an alarmist, but right now, um, you know, we're having a big conversation about voting by mail. Um, you know, lots of people are saying that it's going to lead to fraud and uh, it's not safe. It's not reliable. 
So if we know Latinos are getting their information from social media, and at the same time they're they're seeing these messages uh, that may or may not be true, you know how do how do we in fact help Latinos uh, break through the noise, right? Uh, to help make sure that they understand that, like yes, your participation in in this election and for the census uh, have you because technically the census is still live and people can fill it out. And I encourage you if you haven't done it already to do so immediately. Um, you know there are a lot of people that are still confused as to whether or not a citizenship question uh, is on. Uh, on the census form. So uh, unfortunately, you know, uh, we're, we're having to have these conversations about misinformation, disinformation, uh, because quite frankly, uh, you know, Latinos are a community that's always in the go, go, go. It's not like we're sitting down to watch the evening news every single night. Like we have this phone in front of our hands and that may be the first and only time where we're getting news. So uh, I'm hopeful, I mean, as we continue further on in this conversation, we can talk about, you know, how do we in fact, uh, help our community uh, really understand fact from fiction uh, because it could in fact uh, affect their civic participation in the critical weeks ahead. Yeah, and maybe, you know, uh, I'll turn to you, Hani, to kind of talk us through some of what's happening on these social media platforms that leads to some of these challenges and misinformation. At Common Sense, we actually created a a voting guide for young, a guide for young voters, where you know, with tips on you know how to think critically about breaking news, um, how ad targeting works, a scorecard of social media platforms, and how they're handling election information. And we realized it's not just young voters who are navigating news online. All of us, even those, if you know Fox or MSNBC or Comedy Central is your go-to, we are getting our news on whether it's. Facebook or TikTok or Snapchat or Instagram um, or Twitter. It's how we're take we're taking it in through our social feed. That is what we read. What we are served up is what we read. So what is the challenge in what's the problem in getting your news on social media by a custom feed that platforms create for you? What's what's happening there? Honey, maybe you could break that down for us. Sure. So Christian did a really nice job, by the way, of describing the tension here that there is an upside to social media for organizing. The killing of George Floyd was first put up on Facebook and got national and international attention. Um, there is an upside to social media and then there's the downside. And our job, of course, is to sort of understand these platforms, take advantage of the upside and mitigate the harm. So what you have to understand about social media is that they are in the engagement business. They are in the business of grabbing your attention and holding on to it for as long as possible in order to extract data from you and serve up ads, which is where the profit comes from. This is not unlike the Las Vegas casinos. Their job is to get you into the door, make you lose track of time, make you disoriented, and make you spend as much time in there as possible to separate you from your cash, which they will eventually do. That is what social media does, but it's not your cash, it's your attention and it's your time. And to do that, they algorithmically feed you content that they think will engage you. And they do this through what is called A-B testing. They say, well, if we do, for somebody who has the profile of me, will this lead to more engagement or less engagement? Ah, more engagement, great, give it to them. Is it useful, is it informative, is it true, is it honest, don't care. Maximize engagement, maximize attention grabbing, maximize profits. So that feed you are seeing, whether it's TikTok, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, any feed is algorithmically optimized to grab your attention. And you should understand that because it means that the information you're getting is incredibly biased and colored and you are not being optimized for an informed, thoughtful citizen. And this is why I think we should use Facebook for what it's good for, connecting with friends and family, organizing events, organizing protests. But when it comes to getting information and news about what's happening in the world, we have to go back to trusted sources. And that's not trivial. Um, all news outlets have bias, but they also have editorial standards, which Facebook does not. And so at least there is a gatekeeper at the MSNBCs and CNNs and Foxes and New York Times and BBCs and NPRs and so on and so forth. So there's at least some quality control there, which you simply do not have on social media. Yeah. And Kyra, you know, young people are, are 
digital natives and savvy when it comes to online platforms. And it would seem that really when it comes to misinformation, it's our, you know, moms and grandmas who are going to be the ones who get fooled. Uh, but the research does show that young people are just as susceptible to being fooled by misinformation as, you know, anyone else. So, you know, how do you see young voters and young people navigating kind of uncertain social media territory? Oh, you know, I think too, uh, what Hani and Christian both said, we all need to do a better job. I mean, after all, like the, the Russian bots, they went after everyone. And I think they, they mostly duped an older audience. I think there is also a tendency, even with some mainstream media, that people gravitate toward what they want to hear. You know, years ago, before social media was a big deal, there were many studies that showed that Fox News, for example, was putting a lot of propaganda and inaccurate information out there. But if people wanted to hear their own opinions echoed back to them, they would go to it anyway and kind of subvert this conventional wisdom in these studies that said that this wasn't the right source. So I think with young people, what we're trying to do is what we should do with everyone. And that is just make them make sure they're informed and that they know the difference between source of, of news or a source of opinion, that they know the difference between a pundit and a reporter who is out there doing the, the legwork. I mean, I think with cable news, one other way that we've seen fake news infiltrate beyond social media is we had an influx of pundits take over the airwaves. And with that, a lot of things that people are saying on air were being taken as fact when really they, there was a definite bias there by the person that was speaking. So this is really not a new phenomenon. And I think the advice is the same as it would be in that case, is like really to examine the sources that you're looking into, really make sure that young people are part of the solution as well. I mean, it's true that there's a lot of misinformation on social media, but I also think it's important to point out that young people have been doing black history lessons. They've been doing, talking about systemic injustice. A lot of the Black Lives Matter protests, information has come in through TikTok. TikTok has become not just a place to dance and lip sync, but a place to learn about the history of this country, about some of the monuments that are up, about how indigenous populations are treated. So I think it's, it's a two-way street. And it really is, though the key is that you don't need to go to sources that just reflect back your own thoughts. And I think that's more of a philosophy that we need to get away from as Americans. And it's not necessarily the platform all the time. It's sometimes our mindset of wanting to be um, validated for the views that, that we're spewing without necessarily digging too deeply into the facts. Yeah. And there's, there's bias online and then there's you know, deceptive content that is sometimes highly produced in order to be deceptive. And Absolutely. maybe, Hani, can you give us the deep fakes, cheap fakes, like 411? What is a deep fake? You know, how good are they? How can we not get misled by them? So we've been talking a lot about misinformation and disinformation and lies. And of course, that is a huge problem. Just news stories that are simply factually incorrect. And we are taking, you know, what let's call it a dumpster fire, and now we're going to pour some gasoline on it in the form of deep fakes. So what deep fakes are is a new phenomenon in synthesizing fake images, fake video, and fake audio. And the innovation here is, of course, we've always been able to manipulate images and video um, using Adobe Photoshop or Adobe Premiere or Hollywood Studios or state-sponsored state actors. But the deep fakes, the, the new phenomenon here is that the manipulation is being done by an AI system, an artificial intelligence system. So we've just democratized access to the ability to create Hollywood style manipulated video and audio. So now we have the ability to create uh, an image of a person who doesn't exist and create a fake profile. We have the ability to do what's called a face swap deep fake, where you have one person talking like me and you can put somebody else's face on top of me and it looks like they're saying what I'm saying. Um, you have the ability to do a lip sync deep fake. My favorite one, if you haven't seen it, is President Obama and Jordan Peele. Jordan Peele is talking, he does a great Obama impersonation and they just simply resynthesized uh, President Obama's mouth to make it look like President Obama was saying things that he never said and I never would say. And so now imagine a world where it's not just, well, do I believe this tweet? Do I believe this headline? Do I believe this statistic? But do I believe this video of Joe Biden saying this, of Donald Trump saying this, of Kamala Harris saying this? So and now imagine a world where if you can create these deep fakes, well, then everything can be fake. We have what's called the liar's dividend, where anybody can simply dismiss an inconvenient fact because media can be manipulated. And so to your question, Elizabeth, the technology is developing for deepfake very, very quickly. Every three months, we see rapid development in the quality, the speed, and the efficacy of it. 
Um, and I, you know, I don't think we're there there yet. That is, you know, full blown denial of facts. But I think we are quickly entering that. Um, and as Kyra said very nicely too, while there are real problems with the organizations that allow this stuff on their platforms and promote it, there's a problem with us too that we are eager and often willing to engage with that material because we are eager and willing to believe the worst in the people that we disagree with. And we have to have a serious conversation about that. And of course that starts at the education level and with the very young age, which is why I'm happy we're having this conversation. Great, and if viewers want to learn more about deepfake videos and hear actually from um, Hani about um, some tips on how to avoid them, we do have some resources that are in the chat um, for young people and I would recommend them to, to anyone who um, wants to learn more. Christian, I'll, I'll, and we're talking about education and um, we do have a lot of educators in the audience and um, we are working in schools in terms of supporting young people and building their media literacy skills. You know, how might schools evolve to help young people, especially those approaching voting age, you know, help them more critically navigate social media or participate, be active, um, be civically engaged and participate in politics and activism? Sure, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, so I actually started my career as a teacher. Uh, so I worked at a school in New York City up in Spanish Harlem. Uh, and uh, I was technically a volunteer through AmeriCorps. So I was both, I wore multiple hats at, at the school that I was working at. So I was a college counselor, uh, but I also taught introduction to computers. Uh, so I remember the first day that I arrived Mind you, I had no prior teaching experience. They just threw me in there. Uh, and I remember they gave me a curriculum um, for the introduction to computers class. And so a lot of it was to teach you know, Microsoft Word, Excel. Uh, there was a unit around cyberbullying. But, but I remember, uh, and this is back in 2010, but I, uh, but I remember at the time saying that, you know, this was, <laughs> and don't tell my boss this, uh, it was such a stale curriculum that, that I received. Uh, and and I remember working with my other colleague teaching that class saying like, you know, we need to make this alive, right? And that's the point that I want to make here. Um, you know, when we talk about these issues in a classroom setting, it, it literally cannot be theoretical, right? You could probably assume that your students are already using TikTok, already using Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or whatever it is, right? Uh, and what I did specifically in that classroom uh, was, uh, you know, I, I had graduated with a degree in international affairs. I was a big, like, foreign policy nerd. Uh, and having lived in New York City, uh, I remember every single year when I did this unit, um, you know, the United Nations every single year would invite all the world leaders to come to New York to, to address the world, essentially. And so I remember I set up C-SPAN in my classroom where, um, you know, I would have like a world leader like talking about whatever it is that they were talking about. But I had, I had my students pretend that they were part of their staff. Right. And so it, I remember the unit was around like how to do search terms on Google. So, you know, if, if a particular world leader said like, um, you know, global poverty or uh, nuclear weapons or whatever it was, like I would have my students, uh, you know, do those search terms and like find some relevant data as if they were one of their staffers to somebody else. Right. To, to make sure that they're informed. Uh, so I say all that because um, the bigger lesson that I was trying to teach there is that when you're on the world stage, right, or whatever stage, that words matter, information matters. Like, you wouldn't give President Obama, uh, you know, wrong information, incorrect information, uh, nor would you give President Trump, uh, you know. So, um, you know, I think my students at the time, uh, you know, they, they, they never really did anything like this, right? And so uh, I, I think, I mean, years later after I talk to them and, and catch up with them, they, they always harken back to that to that time saying like, oh yeah, like that was a really cool lesson because, you know, when I put stuff on, on my own social media, like I don't want to be the person that spreads fake news or passes out wrong information because at the end of the day, words matter. So as we enter this election period, um, you know, you wouldn't want to pass out wrong information about how to register to vote. Um, I know there's been a big conversation about poll watchers and poll armies. And um, it's, um, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, so long story short, it's uh, it's just this idea that you, you learn as you do, right? And so, um, you know, I don't know how particular school districts handle these conversations. Uh, this is probably a bad example because I kind of went rogue. <laughs> uh, but uh, at the end of the day, like my 
the principal that I worked for uh, really appreciated it because at the end of the day, uh, students learn by doing. You know, you cannot present them with text, expect them to read it, test them on it later. Like it, it has to be something active so that they really understand like what's going on. Yeah, and maybe I'll 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 build off that and jump to you, Hani. For I mean, there's so much that young people and voters like we can take a lot of initiative, build our skills, be really aware. But you know, there are limitations. We can only do so much, and um, much of the onus here there is onus on uh, social media platforms and fixes that we need to see. So, are are there any examples of platforms? You know, and and we have seen Facebook and Twitter and others. Um, announce um, how they're protecting the elections and they're changing, um, you know, their practices and policies. You know, can you point to any examples of promising, meaningful action that uh, platforms have taken or what you'd like to see happen? Yeah. Um, where would you maybe have platforms start um, so that they're taking as much responsibility as we're asking young people and voters to? Yeah. Well, let me say just also for, for full disclosure before I respond to this is that I am I do sit on TikTok's advisory council and I do have funding in my lab for Facebook. So I have some links to these these organizations. Um, I would say I'm generally disappointed with all the platforms because we knew these problems were here from 2016. Um, and there has been four years to get our house in order. And honestly, we haven't. Um, we are now scrambling in the last days of the election trying to figure out what to do. And that that's really inexcusable. Um, I would say they're all varying degrees of, of not very good, uh, but there are degrees. I think Facebook is probably the worst um, in terms of their policies, their stated policies on how they are dealing with lying and ads. Um, so for example, Twitter and YouTube said no political ads. We don't think we can do it well. We are not going to do it. And I think that was the right choice. Facebook said we can't do it well. Well, we make a lot of money off of it, so we're going to keep doing it. I think that's inexcusable. TikTok also said we are not doing political ads. Um, so I think in that regard, Facebook is doing much, much worse. Um, I think Twitter has slowly um, started to get better about dealing with an administration here in the U.S. that on a daily basis lies to us. That's not a partisan. I'm not I'm not trying to, to criticize Republicans or help Democrats. It's true. And Twitter has slowly started to try to figure out how to do that. Um, but I think they are slow and it's actually not working very well. TikTok is probably the most aggressive in this front. I think when I look at policies around safety and election security, they are the most aggressive in taking down content, banning users and being proactive on this. Is it perfect? No. Is there misuse? Absolutely. Are there problems? Yes. So I think there's degrees of you know, goodness in these platforms, but I think they are being, being weaponized. And I think there is real concern about the upcoming election. Here's my idea, by the way, uh, shut it down, shut the whole thing down, all of social media for 72 hours before the election, 72 hours before. No more uploads to TikTok, no more tweets, no more Facebook, no more, just shut it down. Everybody take a breath for a week. This is not the worst thing in the world. If you have something that you believe is dangerous to society and democracy, we should deal with it. When we have cars that are dangerous, we recall them. When airplanes start falling out of the sky, we ground them. When lettuce has E. coli, we pull every head of lettuce off of every shelf in the country. We respond to real world threats aggressively. This is a threat to our democracy and society, and we should take it, we should treat that accordingly. Shut it down. It's not, it's a week. What, this is good for everybody. You take a breath. There's the best thing you can do is take a vacation from social media. I see a hashtag in the make in the making. Shut it down. Shut it down. Um, yeah. Well, um, one thing I will say though to that is yeah. that, that I think that is brilliant. But we're in a in a country right now where it's clear that wearing a mask would help you not die, and people are mad about that. So <laughs> if you go around like you delete that app or you shut it down, I would hate to see what would happen. You know, people would probably create their own social media. <laughs> I, I don't disagree with you, Kyra, and that is really, it's a truly depressing state of affairs that we are in. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. And if I can add that too, like even beyond the election, um, we're going to have a conversation about a vaccine, right? And so these social media platforms are going to be the place where we say, is it safe or not? And who do I trust? Uh, and so, uh, you know, Haney, you talked about how, you know, this can be a threat to our democracy. It's also a threat to our public health as well. And so for all of us, you know, we really got to figure out how to really handle this conversation uh, 
immediately uh, because, um, you know, ideally we want everyone vaccinated to be healthy and safe, but uh, who knows if it'll happen because people will cr- probably create fake accounts, spread fake news. Um, and that's that's not a good idea for anybody. Right. We've got people drinking bleach, you know, yeah. because of things that they saw on social media. So no, you're, you're yeah. absolutely right. I, I'll, I'll tell you that we are just finishing a large scale uh, survey of misinformation around COVID, uh, both here in the U.S., Western Europe. North Africa and the Middle East and Central and South America. And it is shocking the depth and, um, and, and uptake on COVID related information. As Kyra just said, people who believe that drinking bleach will cure COVID, people who believe that the whole thing is a conspiracy, it's made up. People who believe that Bill Gates created the virus so he can put a microchip into your neck and track you. This, people who believe that 5G wi- wireless uh, networks is causing right. COVID. Right. This is not fringe, the earth is flat, we didn't land on the moon, you know, tinfoil hat people. This is mainstream belief now, because on a daily basis, they're getting inundated with this. And as you said, Christian, the problem is that if you believe that this is a conspiracy, if you believe that this is not real, guess what? You're not going to wear a mask, Kyra, and you're not going to get vaccinated. And there's a real deadly consequences to this misinformation to our society, not just our democracy. And how are these notions going from fringe to mainstream? I mean, is it that how is misinformation allowed to travel so quickly and grow Good. so quickly? Good. Um, QAnon is my favorite example of this. If you haven't heard it, this is really a, a, a loopy conspiracy um, that started on 8chan, this very fringe, you know, true wild, wild west of the internet. It moved from 8chan to Reddit, fringy, but a little bit more mainstream. And then from Reddit, it moved on to Facebook and then to TikTok and then to YouTube. And now in this country, we have at least two congressional candidates who say we are the QAnon for, for U.S. Congress. And so you under, if you haven't heard of QAnon, you should look it up. It basically posits that there is a cable of Democrats um, and Jewish leaders who um, are running a global child pornography ring. Um, And that Trump is the only person who is here to save them. It has this very apocalyptic view. It gets crazier and crazier almost every month. And it started on really fringe sites. And now it is it is the very definition of mainstream. And Facebook allowed it to to incubate. It allowed it to create these groups and, and come up to. And just this week, they finally said, yeah, you know, this is pretty bad. Maybe we should stop this, but it's too late. The thing has taken on a life of its own. And so these things do move uh, across the platforms. And there's this notion that, oh, it happens in the dark web. It's going to stay in the dark web. No, not only do we move to mainstream sites, it shows up in our physical world with congressional candidates. <laughs> oh, you're right, honey. You know, we had to create, and this was really popular on Facebook, which is you know kind of funny. Um, we had to create five things to know about QAnon because it has moved over to TikTok. And so we were having young people ask us about it. Like, what is this? Is it real? So we had to create a disclaimer and break it down so that they could understand and then hopefully share the proper information with their peers. Yeah. And by the way, yeah. there's, there's this tension here too, because you know, when Kyra and her organization, which by the way, I'm a huge fan of, you know, when they now have to tell people, oh, this thing is not real, like, are we making it worse? Because then we sort of promote it in some ways, right? And it's like, you know, it's just, it gets crazy when you have to start, t- when you have to tell people, don't drink bleach. I mean, how crazy have we gotten? I think and this is the real- only way to really kind of fact check it and make it public, because it is there, you know what I mean? And you're right. Like issue corrections in in the news. One of the things we do is we do not repeat the error. So if you're saying something wrong, you don't want to repeat it. But if there's a fever pitch and people are really curious about this, you do have to address it in some way because that's the only way to dispel it. But you're right. It it is almost creating more notoriety, but at the same time, hopefully creating a counter narrative that will stop some of this nonsense. We hope. We hope. Right. Yeah. And you can find that breakdown from YR Media in the chat. Um, Kyra, you know, when it comes to voter suppression and harassment beyond elections, really, I mean, um, technology and and social media platforms have been, it's not an overstatement to say historically awful at protecting disenfranchised communities. Um, What are some of the things that platforms could do better in terms of designing their products to support, for starters, the black community? 
Well, I, I, there's a very easy step. Uh, and that is to actually allow the people that are using the technology to be part of building the technology. And that's really, you know, we do that at YR Media when it comes to media. The only way to fix media and is to have journalists that come from different communities that are underrepresented or misrepresented and have them at the table and have agency. And we feel the same way about these platforms. There's a, a microscopic number of people of color, women working in these technology fields, but yet we're all consumers of this technology. And it's the same reason that my computer doesn't acknowledge me with facial recognition because I have brown skin. You know, somebody who helped design this computer and this interface probably wasn't too concerned about whether, you know, the computer would open for me or not. So I think that the biggest step that we can do is encourage young people to join these fields, which they're already excited about. And when I say encourage, that doesn't mean that we have to go out and beg them. It means that the industry needs to be more welcoming. Um, we have the benefit of having our own interactive team at Wire Media, so there is excitement for it. And I would just like to see that you know spread throughout the industry so that we all have a place at this table. I don't know if, if everyone on the panel has seen it yet, and of course it's got its issues too, but the social dilemma makes a really good point about that. So a mostly white and male industry is creating all this technology, these algorithms, and everybody else is, is using it. And so it's really, you know, privilege and systemic inequities are baked into the products that we're using. And I believe, and I, Wire Media believes that the way to fix that is to change that paradigm. Yeah. Can I, Elizabeth, can I yeah, say please. something? Can I, can I Both echo of that you. point? Yeah. Go ahead, Christian, go ahead. Um, it's the year 2020 and we're... Sorry, I think I lost Christian. So if I can just jump in here, Kyra said something incredibly important. And I want to emphasize that there is a there is a catastrophic failure at all levels of education nationwide in this country right now, somewhere between 15 and 20 percent of computer science majors are women. Um, when it comes to underrepresented groups and people of color, it is in the low single digits. That is a disaster. And we inherited the university level. I'm not blaming the schools behind us, but we have a real problem of representation. And Kyra is absolutely right that when you have affluent white male who are largely driving the technology sector, this is why we are having the problems we have today in the technology sector. We do not have diverse voices. And you don't have to look much further than the mess that is the internet today to believe that diversity of voices across the spectrum really, really matters to make sure that we bring everybody along, not just a few. Christian, Christian are, you, are you back with us? Yeah, can yeah. you guys hear it? Okay, great. Okay, sorry. Sorry. Uh, I hear an echo, but can you hear me better now? Okay, perfect. Sorry. Yeah, sorry about that. My, my Wi-Fi is acting up. Yeah, I just want to quickly echo the points that have already been made. Yeah, because when it comes to the tech sector, uh, even looking at the data within the Latinx population, I think less than 3% of all employees are, are Latinx. It might be even smaller than that. Uh, and and to, uh, to Kyra's point, it's like, yeah, it's it's the products, but it's also the services, right? I mean, like Uber is a service, right? Lyft is a service. Uh, Instacart is a service. And so, uh, you know, the we can't, you know, as communities of color, you know, we, we can't just be happy that, you know, let's say Apple creates these emojis, right, that have different shades of color. Like, that can't be the groundbreaking new thing in tech. Um, you know, one thing that I'm particularly interested in is uh, who is on the, who's actually on the boards of these tech companies, right? When you start to look at the boards, it's primarily, you know, white folks, uh, primarily people who are maybe a little bit older. Um, so when you start to bring in that diversity, it's it's actually to the tech company's own benefit as well, right? Uh, you know, last time I checked, uh, I think it was the Pew Research Center that showed that when you look at who actually uses these platforms, the Latinx population over over indexes than any other racial ethnic group when it comes to Facebook or Instagram. So why wouldn't you as a company uh, revolve your entire way you do business to make sure that you're actually building things that actually matter to your biggest consumer? So, uh, so that's the only point that I'll add. Hopefully you guys heard me. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, forget ethics and the moral thing to do, like a bottom line reason um, to really design these products differently. Um, okay, now let's, let's bring our audience in and um, take questions. I, I believe we have one. Um, how might we prepare and really anyone and 
can chime in and take take these questions. How might we prepare voters, especially first time voters, in the event of uncertain or challenged results on election night and beyond? I'll, I'll share one thought, and, I, and Kyra has said this a few times, and so I want to reiterate it, is there is a tendency to move fast on social media. Everybody wants to be first, the first to retweet, the first to share, the first to like. Slow down. I mean, really, you got to start taking a breath. It is never, it's always important. It has never been more important. This is not a race. So when you see information, please, please slow down, because just like I wear a mask when I go outside because I don't want to spread a virus. We also don't want to spread the virus that is online. Um, you are contributing to the, the, in, the misinformation pandemic that is online and you have to take your responsibility for that very seriously. I definitely agree with that. I think one of the things we've seen is that media entities go to social media to drive story ideation and creation. So when you see a flurry of text about something, some news organization in the effort to be quick is also going to put that up. So it becomes this vicious cycle. So you know, honey is absolutely right. Think about your role in, in spreading information. Think about the credibility of the sources. And, it, and it, it's not a race. I mean, we definitely want information quickly. And I think we're accustomed to that as a country. But at the same time, we want accurate information, not just information, period. So I think it's important also for the media organizations to think about that. Because in your haste to be the first person to announce something, or to make sure that you're going to Twitter and having all the cool, you know, videos and thing and, and hot takes. You know, sometimes some of these hot takes need to cool off a little bit before we repeat them. And I think that's really something important, especially now because we know that there's going to be some form of challenge. They, they've set the stage for that. The current administration. Yeah, and if I can bring back to what you were saying, Haney, uh, I think you convinced me in terms of just shutting it down, <laughs> shutting it down during the election. My work uh, is done here. Yeah, when done. you said I was like, oh, I wonder how that works. I'm like, yeah, no, because as you were saying that, um, how do I how do I phrase this? Like, we're entering into very dangerous territory because on election night, you know, the president can just say, "I won," period, right? And then all of a sudden, people start to retweet it, repost it, whatever it is, right? And that's what will stick. He won, and then that's truth, right? And so. Um, you know, whether it's the candidates themselves or any candidate, really, um, or these media outlets, like you got to be extremely careful and extremely certain that this actually is the case, because one little tweet, one little tweet could actually mean people going out into the streets of America on election night or any other day afterwards and saying, like, this is the result. And I'm going to fight tooth and nail to make sure that either this person stays or, or the next or Joe Biden becomes president. Uh, and it has severe implications for um, for how we treat one another in the months ahead. Yeah. So I think we have time for one more question from the audience. What advice do you have for young people to give them hope? What's one thing they can do to keep their hopes up? Boy, that's a great question. And thank you for that. Um, I, you know, I have to say it's hard to be hopeful these days. Um, there, it is hard looking around the world and our societies and the fires and the, the injustice and the pandemic, and it is hard to be hopeful. Um, I, I will tell you, somebody who is, is older than probably the person asking that question is, I am actually hopeful. I, I do think we're going through a particularly low point. And I think sometimes you have to go through low points to get to the high point. Um, and I, my hope is that we will come out of this better people, better society, better democracy, that you know the movement is in the right direction for gay rights, for black rights, for Hispanic rights, for women's rights. I think the, despite the low, what seems, and it is a low point now, I think the momentum is on our side and I think there are brighter days ahead of us. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say it is, it, we're living in, I think, depressing times, but I'm also really encouraged by the fact that people are willing to come out of their homes and people willing to risk their lives to go out and protest for other people, uh, people that don't look like them, people that, you know, are not in the same so-called category as they are. And that gives me hope. What would really, you know, destroy me is complacency and we're not seeing that. So I think that if you can see even that sort of effort, that, that gives me hope that we have a better future. I mean, my, my mother sat in a colored balcony. So, you know, I know people that have experienced like some of the harshest discrimination 
she's still here, I'm still here, you know, the young people are still here. So as long as there are people that are willing to fight, even amid everything that's going on, I think that's what I would hold on to. Yeah, and I think for me, it's, uh, yeah, I've been doing this for a very long time. And so, I mean, what it boils down to is, you know, if you don't vote, they, they will, right? If you don't speak up, like you will be spoken for. Uh, you know, if you don't fight for yourself and for your community, then be prepared to accept defeat, right? I, I mean, the way I think about it is that, I mean, this is not the most important election of our lifetime. This is actually the election of life and death, right? Like with COVID-19, like it's a terrible virus that uh, has especially affected the education sector, you know, for a lot of the teachers that are watching this right now. Um, and, you know, and and while I'm not here to tell you who to vote for, right, you know, I, you know, I am here to tell you that, you know, the future of this country and the next phase in our fight against COVID uh, actually lies with all of you, right? So do you wanna see your friends again? You know, do you want your teachers to be safe? Uh, are, are you content with spotty Wi-Fi as, as I've been experiencing today? Um, you know, it, it, it's interesting because one in 10 voters in this country for this upcoming election are Gen Z voters. Like they are actually going to be the difference in this election. And, you know, I'm incredibly sorry to the Gen Z generation because the burden of democracy actually rests with them. And so just like it did for their parents during the civil rights movement and their grandparents, you know, when they fought against the, the rise of fascism across this world, right? It's always been young people that have literally turned the corner for this country and for humanity. And I'm counting on them to really come out in big numbers for this election. Well said. Absolutely. Well, this has been such an inspiring conversation and I wanna thank our guests, Kyra, Christian, and Hani. Um, you can check out all of our election related resources at commonsense.org. We have previous conversations with Common Sense on race, mental health, parenting in a pandemic, navigating distance learning on our YouTube channel. And you can subscribe to the channel to get regular updates on our upcoming events. Thanks so much for joining us today. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.